Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded and a time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, you're invited to join our chat room by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. My partner Ravinder is here in the studio and monitoring the chat room now. So Ravinder, say hello to everyone and please pass on some info about your upcoming marathon. (laughs) Hi everyone. Yes, I do. I am planning to try the marathon i've got it in two weeks time i'm towards the end of my intensive training and now it's in the recovery mode and build up energy so yeah if you want to send me good energy for that that would be most appreciated Uh, the longest run i've done to date is just under 20 miles and i have to do 26 so i'm excited about it actually I am really excited about it. You have worked very hard, and you deserve, you know, a pat on the back for for your tenacity. That's for doggone sure. I'm enjoying it. I am enjoying it. But there there is that feeling of achievement, too. It's like every time you reach higher and then you discover, you know, when we started to run, when I started to run, running for three minutes killed me. Absolutely. I remember well absolutely killed me and so the first time I ran for one hour that was miraculous Um, and now I run for considerably longer and I said every time you have an achievement like that then it just makes you stronger for the other things that go on in life it's like if I can handle that I can handle anything you know I'm actually a little envious I stayed with it at 12k pulled up a, a hip injury and that kind of took me out of it and uh and I look at you running 20 miles, and I've actually measured that distance. I've driven in the car to see how, f- and I thought, no, you know, maybe maybe it was good my hip said to me, that's enough, 12K is enough. But I do pat myself on the back because you would have quit on that 12K, uh, but for me. I would, that 12K and, kill me. <laughs> and, and today, you know, the thought of you running 26 miles is like, well, I'm just super, super proud of you. You just, that's just fantastic. I admire that. Thanks. All right. Everybody, go to the chat room, uh, provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. And, you know, give her some energy. Give her some encouragement. 26 miles in two weeks. All right. Two weeks from now. I'm not, it's not going to take me two weeks to run it. <laughs> I hope not. I'll be waiting. <laughs> In today's spotlight, I would like to address the notion often referred to as sins of the father. The Bible informs us, according to Exodus 20 and 5, quote, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, close quote. However, later in the Bible, we can find many verses such as this one from Deuteronomy 24 and 16, quote, fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin, close quote. So what is the story here? Are we to think that Only those who hate God are to be visited by the sins of their father? What does science have to say about all this? Epigenetic research informs us that experience is passed down to our offspring. For example, where one's ancestors lived or how much they valued education can clearly have effects that pass down through the generations. But what about the legacy of their health, whether they smoked, endured famine, or fought in a war? Is that passed along too? 
Biologists first observed this transgenerational epigenetic inheritance in plants. Tomatoes, for example, pass along chemical markings that control an important ripening of the gene. But over the past few years, evidence has been accumulating that the phenomena occurs in rodents and humans as well. The subject remains controversial, in part because it harkens back to the discredited theories of Lamarck, a 19th century French biologist who proposed that organisms pass down acquired traits to future generations. To many modern biologists, that's scary sounding, says Oliver Rando, a molecular biologist at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, whose work suggests that such inheritance does indeed happen in animals. If it is true, he says, quote, why hasn't this been obvious to all the brilliant researchers in the past hundred years of genetics, close quote. According to research carried out at RMIT University, dad's diet before they conceive could be genetically passed on to the next generation with a subsequent impact on those children's mental health. And that has been one of the findings. Many scientists argue that criminality is largely inherited. Indeed, after examining the DNA profiles of almost 1,000 criminals, two particular genes were found to be associated with violent, but not nonviolent, behaviors. Like many issues of this nature, scientists are quick to balk at the idea that it's in our genes. Genetics made me do it. The subject is somewhat like the free will argument for worse. Most scientists today believe, as Franz de Waal put it when speaking to me about free will, it's a grand illusion. The problem is that when we discuss things like genetics and free will in this context, it provides a defense for bad behavior, and no one wants to go there. The origins, the idea of original sin, something Lamarck argued is present in our genes, together with the behavior, environment, and even memories or memes, in the words of Richard Dawkins, of the parent are gaining momentum today. So what if our genetic makeup predisposes us in certain ways? Does that necessarily mean that our genes have absolute control? Identical twin research has led to some remarkable discoveries. Take Jim Lewis and Jim Springer, who were raised apart from the age of four weeks. When the twins were finally reunited at the age of 39 in 1979, they discovered they both suffered from tension headaches, were prone to nail biting, smoked Salem cigarettes, drove the same type of car, and even vacationed at the same beach in Florida. Interestingly, this pair of twins is not unique. Study after study of identical twins reared apart has revealed substantially the same genetic influence. Despite this, twin research also shows a good deal of variance. The fact is, as geneticist Carl Bruder of the University of Alabama at Birmingham puts it, quote, I believe that the genome that you're born with is not the genome that you die with, at least not for all the cells in your body, close quote. We all have opportunities to improve our lot in life, and we can work toward doing just that. And for that reason, I am convinced that we are not destined to live out a life limited by our inheritance. As such, my advice, dare to dream big, set goals, and move forward toward becoming the very best version of you. My thoughts anyway, what are yours, Ravinder? I find the whole subject really interesting. You know, the whole nature-nurture argument is where I tend to focus it on more than anything else. Um, I'm looking forward to today's interview. You know, I mean, to me, it, the environment part of it becomes pretty obvious. Um, but there does seem to be quite a bit of research out there that shows that genetics actually plays a larger role in it. So, Well, if you've read Stephen Pinker's Blank Slate, then you know that this idea of the blank slate and the noble savage... 
is really just rubbish, and that indeed the genetics uh, have more, much more influence upon us than the so-called nurture aspect. But sociobiologists are still under great attack for some of the implications to that, uh, that approach. All right. Every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Andy wrote, I just love your show. John wrote, Dr. Taylor, you have the best radio show on the air, barring none. Thank you for what you do. I appreciate that, John, but it's Ravinder that adds all the character and flair to this show. Isn't that true, Ravinder? No, not even where, where's slightly. It? Uh, oh, come on. You're blushing. No. It's hard to get you to blush. <laughs> Jan wrote, Dr. Taylor, I want to personally thank you for all the years of inner talk messages that you created and that I have enjoyed. They have made me more confident and more able to focus academically and compete in athletic events. I like the fact I can use these in my car or with headphones at night. My sincere appreciation to you. Albert wrote, I have used your products for years and they have worked well for me and my family. And Tiffany wrote, Dear Mr. Taylor, thank you so much for developing wonderful tools. I passed my project management professional certificate certification yesterday and i believe that you were a big part of it the certification is a gold standard in my profession and the test has been referred to as one of the hardest exams a person will ever take for someone who has never liked test or math especially tests that are heavy on reading comprehension and math calculations that was not great to hear the information to study and learn is huge the study book looks like a telephone book i thought often how will i ever learn and retain all this information in July, I took a boot camp to begin the study process and got a 60 on the final mock-up exam. After that, I studied and took practice, practice tests. After practice tests, scoring 65 at the highest, there was a lot of studying in between, too. And with an established real test date, I started to feel defeated. I believed I could not keep this in my head. That's when I remember I purchased accelerated learning and power learning one and two inner talk a while ago and i started to listen to them as i was going to sleep after only two times my practice test scores went up 12 points and then reached an 80 last week in total i listened to them for three weeks up until the night before the test and kept studying in that time and i passed the exam today and on the first try and in three of the five knowledge areas scored above standard. When I would start to struggle with studying or on the test, I would internally hear myself correct my thoughts to it's okay, you're prepared, and you know this. Take a deep breath. You can learn this, and I did. So thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Tiffany, and all of you for your feedback. We love that feedback, do we not, Ravinder? We do indeed. We have, I don't know, we've heard from people that have taken the, all kinds of, the bar exam, all kinds of examinations. Um, in fact, test anxiety was one of those that we had a double-blind study mm -hmm. uh, carried out on at Stanford University. Uh, it, and it, it really pleases me, though. I mean, it's wonderful we have the studies, tight scientific, rigorous uh, data, but nothing means as much to me as when we hear from someone like Tiffany who's used the program and made their dreams come true. Absolutely. It's the best part of the job is those kinds of success stories. Okay, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But we do love your comments, so please keep them coming. You can opine by writing to me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. We do sincerely appreciate your thoughts and ideas. Now to today's show. It didn't start with you. You inherited family trauma shapes, who we are, and how to end the cycle with author Mark Woolman. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. Mark Woolman is a director of the Family Constellation Institute in San Francisco. He is a leading expert in the field of inherited family trauma. He has taught at the University of Pittsburgh, the Western Psychiatric Institute, the Omega Institute, the New York Open Center, and the California Institute of Integral Studies. Mark specializes in working with depression, anxiety, obsessive thoughts, fears, panic disorders, self-injury, 
chronic pain, and persistent symptoms and conditions. His book, It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle, is the winner of the 2016 Nautilus Book Award in Psychology and the subject of today's show. Okay, on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. Mark Wolin. Hi, nice to meet you, Eldon. Uh, it's indeed my Good pleasure. I've been looking again, forward Rinder. to it. Wonderful book. Wonderful book. I love your book. It, 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 I love how you told the story, knitted the story together as well. I've got some pretty good questions for you today, though. But before we start, we like to know three things on this show. Mark, who is the messenger? What is the message? And, of course, how do we use it? To that end, what are you passionate about? And what led you to writing your new book? So, you know, I like uh, a lot of people. I struggled with symptoms that I couldn't explain, which led me uh, through many wormholes through the other side. Um, it, well, I didn't set out to write this book on inherited family trauma. I lived it. Uh, technically, uh, I lost my eyesight about 30 years ago. Um, and I became passionate about this idea that, that we carry a mystery, that we, we all live with this mystery that we can't explain, fears we can't explain, anxieties that strike suddenly after a particular event or when we reach a certain age or depression we never get to the bottom of. And what I've learned is we, we have these symptoms, but they may not be ours. You know, like the title of the book, It Didn't Start With You, these symptoms can be the residue of traumas in our family history that we've biologically inherited from our parents and grandparents. And, and that's my passion. That's what I, that's what I teach. Let me let me ask you this. I mean, I, I'm going to just you know, flesh out. You lost your eyesight 30 years ago, and you're implying that, of course, that was an inherited trauma. Well, uh, I didn't know it at the time. Right. Uh, you know, I began to lose the vision in one of my eyes, and I was diagnosed with a chronic form of retinopathy, and uh, the doctors couldn't cure it. And then the way it was progressing, I was told I was going to lose the vision in the other eye, too, because it also began to scar up, and, and I was, you can only imagine, I was desperate to find help. And uh, the m- medical community could offer very little, so I went on a personal search for healing, um, a search that, that, that led me halfway around the globe, literally as far as Indonesia, where I learned from several wise teachers who taught me some fundamental, fundamental principles Uh, one of which was the importance of healing my relationship with my parents that had been terribly broken. But before I could do that, I had to heal what stood in the way, which, though I didn't know it at the time, inherited family trauma, specifically the anxiety that I, I had inherited from my grandparents, all of whom were orphaned in some way. Three of them lost their mothers when they were babies, and the fourth lost her father at age one, So technically, she loses her mother, too, in the grief. And the anxiety that rippled in my body, the terror of of, uh, being broken from a mother's love or the terror of loss, as I would find out later, this was the real cause of my vision loss, which the doctors could only say, you have stress. And And, and this is what had been passed down in my family. In fact, I remember... I'll tell you a story. I remember as a small boy, maybe five or six, feeling panicked when when my mother would leave the house. I'd go into her room, I'd cry into her scarves and nightgowns, thinking that I'd never see her again and that her smell would be the only thing I had left, And which would have been true for all my grandparents, because that a smell on a garment would have been the only thing they had left. And then 40 years later, I shared this with my mom, who was alive at the time, And she told me, uh, you know, I did the exact same thing when my mother left the house. I cried into her her garments. And then my sister reading the book said, honey, I did that too. I cried into mom's clothes. And basically after healing, what I would learn to be would be a broken bond with my mom, as everyone had had in the history, my vision came back. And then afterwards I felt compelled to share these principles that I'd learned and 
Ultimately, I developed a, a method for healing the effects of inherited family trauma. Great, great. You heard today's spotlight, Mark. Um, I did. Genetics clearly impact our lives, but are we predestined to suffer accordingly? You know, Eldon, epigenetics is only one ingredient in the soup. Um, to say that it's all that makes up a complex human being, of course, it's simplistic, but we have to go back and, and look at, well, first let's start with the environment. We know, in fact, we've known for a hundred years, um, uh, embryologists have told us that the female egg line stops dividing when our mom is five months a fetus inside grandma's womb. So when we look at that, one of those eggs will become us. So we and our, so the essence, our essence and our mom both reside in the environment of our grandmother's womb. So clearly, we would know something of grandma's experience from essentially existing even in that form. Now, having said that, um, it goes beyond uh, environment because of what we're now learning about trauma. Trauma passes on. Uh, Technically, when a trauma happens, it, it changes us. Literally, it changes us. It causes a chemical change in our DNA. And this changes how our genes function, sometimes for generations. So technically you have a, uh, after a trauma, a chemical tag will attach to our DNA and tell, it tells our cells to use or ignore a certain gene. And then the way the genes are affected by this changes how we act or feel. For example, we can become reactive to situations that are similar to the original trauma a parent or grandparent experience so that we can deal with it better. And these gene changes, as we have inherited from our parents, we can transmit to our children. One of the examples I use to explain it goes like this. If our grandparents came from a war-torn country, let's say, there's a lot of violence, there's bullets, there's bombs, there's arrests, there's, you know, uh, being shot in the square, they would, they, they would pass forward a skill set of terror along with sharper reflexes, quicker reaction times to help us survive the trauma they experience. But the problem is we could also inherit a stress response with the dial set to 10 prepared for a catastrophe that never arrives in our lifetime. And here we are with fears and feelings that originated with our parents or grandparents, and and we don't make the link. We think that those feelings are ours, and we blame ourselves. We, we just, you know, I hear this over and over again from clients. Well, I'm just wired this way. This is who I am. Uh, it's just It's just the way I'm wired. And that's not always true, because we're not born with a clean hard drive. That notion's uh, been, been kicked, kicked out of the arena. There, there now appears to be a, an operating system, to use a computer analogy, Absolutely. already in place that contains the fallout from the traumas of our parents and our grandparents. And here, here we are, born with these fears and feelings that don't belong to us. This is actually why I wrote the book, so people can make these links and break the cycle. I, you know, I have to ask you something. Uh, it's a bit of an aside, but it, uh, it it's relevant, I think, uh, to the subject. There are a lot of folks, myself included. I, I remember walking into a geometry class in high school, sitting down, opening up the textbook, and what was in the textbook I already knew. There was no reason for me to know it. Uh, I hadn't studied geometry before. Uh, you know, it was like, how did I, and, and to this day I say often, how did I know that? And I've, I've known several people who have had similar such exper- experiences, and it's usually they dismiss it as, well, it must be some past life memory. Okay, <clears throat> here's the question. Past life, as in my grandmother's or my great-grandfather's, 
What are your thoughts on those kinds of things? You know, I, 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 don't, I can't comment on past lives that don't exist in, outside of our family um, situation, but I can comment quite a bit on the past life uh, meaning of our, the past experiences, let's use that word, of our parents and grandparents. Uh, I'll give you an example. I once worked with this guy with a rare neurological disorder who began experiencing uh, intense burning pain sensations on his skin when he was about 10 years old. So I started to ask him uh, about traumas in his family, and he dropped the bomb. He said, well, when my father was 10, he was playing with matches, and accidentally he burned the house down, and his brother died in that fire, and my father never forgave himself. Now, what I've experienced over and over again is because the trauma remained unhealed, unresolved, because there was too much terror for this man to heal it. He felt so guilty that the man's son, my client, began experiencing the symptoms around the same age that his father experienced the trauma. Now, he never made this connection, but after working together, the symptoms subsided. So when I see this again and again, symptoms subsiding when we work in this way, I've got to, I've got to take this in consideration. The lives of our parents and grandparents affecting us is significant. In, fa- in fact, science have long suspected this, Eldon. You know, but yeah, they know. Did, it wasn't until, as you noted in the beginning, it wasn't until... You know, t- 12 years ago, that, that science has finally begun to build the evidence. It started with Rachel Yehuda, a, neuro- a neuroscientist out of Mount Sinai Medical in New York. She discovered accidentally that the children of Holocaust survivors shared the same trauma symptoms, specifically the low levels of cortisol, the stress hormone that helps us get back to normal after a stressful event. They shared th- the same depression, the same anxiety as their parents. And then she finds a similar pattern in the children who were born to mothers who were at or near the World Trade Center when they were pregnant. And then these babies come out with different genetic markers, 16 different genetic markers, and they're smaller for their gestational age. And then she finds out that survivors, and this is, this is a study I like best, you know, it's pure, purely biological. She finds out the survivors and their children share the exact same gene changes in the exact same region of the exact same gene. Technically, the FKBP5 gene for all of your listeners who know their genes. Um, But this suggests that traumas are heritable. Absolutely. And she goes on to say that you and I are three times more likely to have symptoms of PTSD when one of our parents had PTSD. And then as a result, we too are likely to struggle with anxiety or depression. All right, Mark, we have a hard break. When we come back, we'll pick it up where we are. We're speaking with Mark Wolin about his work and book, It Didn't Start With You. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at Mark Wolin, Wolin, W-O-L-Y-N-N, markwolin.com. Now, we have a video for you today featuring our guest answering a very difficult question. So if you're not already in the chat room, now's the time to get on over there, and you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD, and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your InnerTalk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. 
Check it out today by going to intertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Mark Wolin about his work and book, It Didn't Start With You. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at markwolin, that's W-O-L-Y-N-N, dot com. Okay, every week we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some real meaning to them. Music psychology is, of course, a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior, as well as an avocation of mine. Now, you've chosen music, uh, Mark, uh, by Leonard Cohen, uh, performing Going Home. So please tell us, why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So here's this, uh, this guy, Leonard Cohen, writing a song in the voice of God talking to him. And... He writes about things about surrender, that he has no choice but to do and to repeat and to follow what he feels inside himself, as though he can hear or is commanded to follow his inner voice. And I'm a, a, a big teacher of following our inner voice, whether whether we think that voice comes from any spiritual origin or it just originates from something we can't quite understand within, but it's one of the ways in which we heal. Um, we, we follow what feels true. And if that truth is poignant enough, potent enough, we trust it enough, we heal. Basically, to heal, we need to have an experience uh, powerful enough to uh, override that trauma response, trauma response that lives inside so many of us that can pull traction away from our highly efficient, what I like to call limbic lockdown, that highly efficient trauma cycle that keeps us in a state of suffering. And when we can pull some energy away from that mechanism and engage deeper areas, areas of the brain, specifically our prefrontal cortex, um, that's where we grow, that's where we heal, that's where we integrate, and that's how our brains change. I didn't know I was going to say all that about that song, but, interesting, it, but that song interesting. sure, sure led I, I, I find the lyrics, um, I mean, I understand the idea of, uh, you know, a, a self, a higher self, uh, something uh, talking to himself, whatever you want to call that, uh, God consciousness, uh, whatever. Um, but it is self-deprecating. I love to speak with Leonard. He's a sportsman and a shepherd. He's a lazy bastard living in a suit. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Is, he, he says, I'm just the brief, el- I'm nothing. I'm just yeah. the brief elaboration of a tube. It's great. Yeah. It's, I love that. And in fact, it, he... Maybe if we all took that perspective, humble. we wouldn't find ourselves so serious and yeah. life could be a little <laughs> well, whatever. Okay, yeah. let me let's get back to the point. Um, <laughs> when your ancestor goes through a period of excessive stress, this experience is said to be added to your genome. An extra right. layer of information is placed on top of your DNA sequences, and the DNA sequence itself, where it doesn't change, it's it's analogous to its clothes do, so to speak. Right. Right. So. Now, it's said that this information can be passed down for up to 14 generations. What are your thoughts on that? 14 generations? Well, uh, I know that there are studies out there with worms that look at 14 generations, but we're not worms. What, what we can say with any type of um, uh, specificity is that 
maybe three generations. And how they discern that is they uh, study mice and rats. And the reason they use mice and rats is because mice and rats share, strangely enough, 99% of a similar genetic makeup with humans. That means 99% of the genes in humans have counterparts in mice, with about 80% being identical. And the reason they can get this information relatively quickly is because a generation in mice is 12 to 20 weeks, where in humans it's 12 to 20 years. So the patterns are observed for two generations in humans, for sure. But the study with uh, animals, rodents, mice, show us that we can observe this for at least three generations. In my, in my favorite study, the one done at Emory Medical University Medical School in Atlanta, they, they took male mice, and they made them fear a cherry blossom-like scent. In other words, every time the mouse smelled the scent, they shocked the mouse. Right. And they already found, just by shocking that mouse, epigenetic changes in that first gener- generation in the brain. There were enlarged areas in the brain where greater smell, uh, greater amount of smell receptors existed so the mouse could protect itself by detecting the scent at a lesser concentration. Well, what was strange is the, the mice passed down these adaptive changes to protect them, their brains had adapted, and now there's changes in the blood and in the sperm. So they take some of the sperm, and they impregnate female mice that weren't shocked. And then they looked at the progeny in the second and third generations. And here's the cool part. The pups in the second and third generation became jumpy and jittery just by smelling the smell. They were never shocked. In other words, they had inherited the stress response without directly experiencing the trauma. Right, right. And I guess, you know, there's a bit of a difference between um, conditioning, which is the kind of a story that we just shared, and a parent having a trauma. And, 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 and I look at this and I say just practically, okay, Let's assume that you uncovered a trauma as you did, your uh, eyesight-related trauma. And you then remediated this situation. You you, you healed it. Are you you genetically predisposed still to pass on that characteristic? Or in the remediation, have you more or less canceled the characteristic? Isn't that interesting? I have a study in my book that I talk about that just came out two years ago, where they take the mice that had been traumatized and they could see the effects in the pups for three generations. But then they put those same traumatized mice in a positive environment, in a healing environment, and they saw genetic cha- epigenetic changes where the mice not only improved their behaviors but were less likely, less likely, to pass forward that genetic predisposition toward suffering. Yeah, excellent. So for our listeners, I mean, one of the great benefits of understanding this information, of getting your book, which I highly recommend, and once again, the title is It Didn't Start With You, um, is that if, if we heal these, we eliminate in our children or perhaps our grandchildren, at least we minimize, the odds are increased that we minimize or eliminate the inherited aspect of of the trauma that we had. Have I got that right? Absolutely. Okay. Well said. Now let me ask this. Uh, you know, the scent of something is a trigger. Do we need a trigger in order for us to experience this trauma? Uh, Uh, That's another great question. Okay, so sometimes, yes. Elton, there there are definitely some telltale signs of an irritant trauma. So we can experience a fear or an anxiety or a symptom that strikes suddenly after one of these triggers. And the trigger could be 
when we reach a certain age or when we hit a certain milestone. And then it's as though there's an, this ancestral uh, alarm clock that goes ringing inside of us. For example, we get married or, or we have a child or we get rejected by a partner for the first time or we move to a new place. And then all of a sudden we have a, a symptom. I'll tell you a case. I worked with this woman once who was consumed with anxiety once she became pregnant. And she hadn't had a large degree of anxiety prior to that. It was all from the trigger of being pregnant. So I said to her, all right, let's, let's go into this anxiety together and see what's going on. And uh, what's the worst thing that will happen with you being pregnant, this new baby? She goes, and, and all of a sudden she said, I'll, 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 I'll harm my baby. That's what will happen. I'll harm my new baby. And so I asked her, had you ever harmed a baby? She said, no. I said, had anyone in your family ever harmed a baby? And she said, no. And then she said, wait a minute. It, all of a sudden it jogged her memory. This was not on the forefront of her brain. Um, her grandmother, as a young mom, lit a candle, caught the curtains on fire. The curtains caught the house on fire. The baby was upstairs. She ran up, but the fire was too dense. She couldn't get upstairs. Her baby died in the fire. And then my client said, but we were never allowed to talk about it. You never brought that up with Grandma. Mm -hmm. So, which is one of the components. When people are rejected, people are excluded, you can't talk about something. It's not talked about. So this woman had inherited the fear from her grandmother's experience. Right. Okay, on a more practical level, I suppose, especially for our listeners, let's assume you, you know, you, you've had some anxiety or something attached or there's something that bothers you, some, so, you know, some areas you say that you don't want to talk about or some place you don't want to go, et cetera, and so forth. How are they to know that that's really, I mean, how, how do we discern, how do we learn whether or not it's an inherited uh, trauma, an inherited instinct, an inherited, um, what should I say, predisposition, avoidance, or what have you? How do we? How do, how do we know? How do we? Do, how do we learn uh, that, that's what whether or not it's book. sad or it's just you know whatever? Yeah, that's so. In the book, I teach the reader how to become a detective, to uncover the clues in in his words or words, and make those links. So I've discovered that there's this thing called, I call it core language, trauma right. language, that lives in us. And so it lives in our words and the way we describe our fears and the way we describe our parents. And it's in our unexplained symptoms. It's not even verbal. It's in our destructive behaviors. If you start to put together a breadcrumb trail, of what we, and I teach the reader how to do this, of what we say, what symptoms we're experiencing, what destructive behaviors we're repeating, what relationship struggles we're repeating, even the ways we deal with uh, money, success, you know, basically what I like to say, the potholes that we continually step in, all of this forms a breadcrumb trail that gives us a glimpse of what may have happened in our family, even if we don't know it even if the story's been lost or kept secret. And when we can parse this out, we, it helps us explain why we feel the way we feel. So I teach people how to pull out this trauma language or this nonverbal language and explore the events and behaviors, not just in ourselves, but in our family, if we know them. And that's you how actually... We, yeah. You actually also do do a very good job, I think, at, at assisting whoever the book reader is in resolving those conflicts. Uh, right. Uh, right. I have a lot you of know, Some people sell a right. book in order so they can sell a course or something else. I, I, I found your book very complete. Oh, thank it, you. Recently, um, you posted on Facebook uh, about the DNA um, slavery cruelties. Um if it's three generations, we should be on the other side of that. Do, do you believe that uh, we're, you know, all of this racial tension that's in our country, is that 
also a genetic inheritance, maybe going back even to the days of slavery in this country. So, so let's look at that at, in terms of three generations. Let's start scientifically. If the slaves experienced that trauma, which was a horrific trauma, there would be remnants and elements of those traumas that would have been replicated in the next three, four, five, six, seven, because they keep repeating. So when we've had cultures who've experienced uh, great trauma or oppression, like slavery or the Holocaust or massacres or, you know, the residential schools in Canada or genocide in Cambodia, you know, we're going to see remnants of these traumas in the generations to follow. Um, what, what types of things we're going to see? Anxieties about personal safety. Uh, families forcibly being broken apart. Uh, children who don't get to be raised by their parents, fears of authority, loss of freedom, uh, patterns of depression, anxiety, anger, violence, social frustration, you name it. But we'll, we'll, we can see this in subsequent generations. Remember, slavery may have stopped in 1865, but right. that's when lynchings began. And they were lynching blacks up until probably... 50 years ago, and now it continues in a different way, a different form, maybe uh, the way black men suffer at the hands of police. So what, what can we say? We've certainly got to take and look at our past and talk about what happened in the past so we can heal the, the present and the future. For example, you know, I find that when we ignore the past, it comes back to haunt us. Amen. But when we explore it, we don't have to repeat it. We can heal these traumas, heal these patterns, and maybe live a freer and, and, life. And we really need to heal it as a society. I mean, we really need to come to grips with it as a society, not just individually, but Absolutely. to understand this influence as a society. Uh, we we need you... to shine a light on what's been unresolved. Where have people been rejected or excluded? Um you know, now we're seeing children separated from their parents at the border, uh, women facing predators in the workplace, uh, black men killed by police. I mean, where does it end? Yeah, well, and, you know, and, and, and I think also, you know, listen, we have places in the world where America and we're, we're – the inhabitants are taught that Americans are evil, that, you know, the highest duty you can do is to destroy them or, or Jewish people. We have, we have places where there is hatred um, inculcated into the fabric of infants, and that, too, has its Absolutely. genetic power. So and when we, we talk about that hatred, if only the hater could look back at his family traumas. You know, that's, that's one of my dreams, right? My dream is to, to work with, uh, in, a, in a forensic, psychological sense, with the history of those of us who struggle or hurt. You know, they always say out and hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And if we yeah. can look back in the history of the herder, the hater, they would see um, great trauma that separated them from love, that separated them from connection. Well, and, it, you know, I think you've got a huge mission in front of you. I greatly admire your work, uh, your contribution. I'd like to see you in Congress talking to uh, the leaders of this country. I, you know, I'd like to see seminars of the kind that you do conduct uh, being run um, on a national level, you know, on, on public television. Uh, <laughs> where we all plug in and understand that it's just not simply a matter of saying, okay, I'll let that go, that there's something much deeper involved in what's underlying much of the crisis in our world. Listen, we have about 30 seconds. I want to give that to you to tell everybody how to reach out, how to find you, how to learn more, Mark. Okay, yeah. You know, I just want to say that's that's how... Why, that's why I wrote this book, so people could pick it up and make changes, real significant changes. Anyway, I'm Mark Wolin, uh, Mark, M-A-R-K-W-O-L, 
www.ynn.com. I have a Facebook page where I post a lot of pertinent information, Facebook slash Mark Willen. And um, thank, thank you, Elton, for having me. What a, what a nice conversation. So much fun. Indeed, my pleasure. I, I've loved the conversation as well. Keep us posted on what you do. I'd love to have you back. We've thank come you. to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show. We'll join us again next week, same time, same place, and do. Tell your friends, let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.